Today we deal with a classic problem in economics, the double marginalization problem. This has a lot of applications, not just to development, but also to industrial organization, to innovation theory, particularly about patents, and to a lot of other different areas. Let's take a look. We can get an intuitive understanding of the double marginalization problem by looking at the Rhine River. Now, tourists love to sail down the Rhine River because every few miles there are these beautiful castles. These castles, however, were not the vacation homes of the rich. They were actually toll booths. They were put there in order to charge people coming down the river. Now, the problem is that the upper river monopolists, the upper river castles, the more that they charged, the less were the revenues for the downstream monopolists. But the upper stream monopolists, they don't care about the downstream monopolists, so they would set their prices really high in order to charge, in order to make a lot of money, not taking into account the fact that this would reduce the profits of the downstream monopolists. Of course, the downstream monopolists are actually in the same situation. The more they charge, the fewer people want to come down the river to begin with, and they charge a high price as well not taking into account the fact that this is going to reduce the profits of the other king, of the other prince, who is further up or f higher up on the river. So the fact that there are multiple monopolists means that prices are set too high and output is too low. Notice I don't mean that prices are too high simply from the point of view of the consumers. I mean that prices are actually too high from the point of view of the monopolists taken as a group. So if the monopolists could get together, if there was a single king controlling all the river, then he would just have one castle, perhaps, one monopoly price that would maximize profits. Instead, we get lots of different monopolies. They charge too high prices collectively. This reduces trade. And all of the monopolies together are actually worse off than if they could coordinate. So that's the double marginalization problem. It says that two monopolies, two vertical monopolies, are much worse than one. They're more than twice as bad as one monopoly. Let's take a look at this using some graphs. OK, here's the standard monopoly profit maximization story, which you can find in any Principles of Economics textbook. Of course, I recommend Modern Principles by Cowan and Tabarrok. So here's the demand curve for the monopolist's product. Here's the marginal revenue curve, and here's the marginal cost curve. The marginal revenue curve tells the monopolist what is the addition to revenue from selling one more unit. The marginal cost curve tells the monopolist what is the addition to cost from producing one more unit. What the monopolist wants to do is keep producing so long as the marginal revenue, the addition to revenue from selling one more unit, exceeds the addition to cost from selling one more unit. Thus, the monopolist wants to produce until marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. At this point, point A, we find the profit maximizing quantity. And then we ask, well, what is the most the monopolist can sell this quantity for per unit? It's $3 per unit. OK. The profit is then given by this green area, the profit to the monopolist. And the deadweight loss is given by this area here. This is the deadweight loss happens because consumers are willing to pay, they value the product more than its marginal cost, but the monopolist is not willing to sell to these consumers because to do so would require that he lower the price and thus lower his profits. OK. Now, one slight twist here we can think about the marginal cost curve here. Imagine that this monopolist is buying its inputs from a competitive industry. So the marginal cost to the monopolist is the price of the inputs. Let's follow that up a little bit more. OK, here's our previous diagram. We're now going to assume this is a monopoly retailer, which is going to be supplied by a monopoly wholesaler. Now, from the point of view of the retailer, this is its marginal cost. And that's the price which is set by the wholesaler. And to make things simple, we're going to assume that every unit produced by the retailer requires one input from the wholesaler. 
So think about cars and engines. The retailer sells cars. For every car it sells, it needs one engine from the wholesaler. Now what this tells us from the point of view of the wholesaler is that if the wholesaler sets a price of $1, then it will sell 100 units to the retailer. Imagine that the wholesaler sets a different price. So suppose the wholesaler sets a price of $1.75. Well, then we know that the retail monopoly is going to want to choose the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. That is, let's say, at a quantity of 80. So the wholesaler knows that if the price is $1.75, the quantity it sells is 80. Now notice, that means that the marginal revenue curve for the retailer is actually the demand curve for the wholesaler. This curve tells us whatever price the wholesaler sets, it tells us the quantity demanded by the retailer. So we can think about this as the demand curve for the wholesaler. OK, let's get rid of that. And now let's add, well, what price will the wholesaler want to set? Well, if this is the demand curve for the wholesaler, we need to find the marginal revenue curve for the wholesaler. That's the curve with just twice the slope, similar to what we had before. We can now see that the a wholesaler will choose the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Okay, This is now the true marginal cost for the wholesaler. And sets a price of, let's say, $3. Okay. Now that we know the wholesaler's price, that tells us what the input price is going to be for the retailer. So let's go back and see what the retailer does. So now we know the price, which is going to be set by the wholesaler. And that, of course, is equal to the marginal cost from the point of view of the retailer. The retailer will choose that price and quantity such that marginal revenue is equal to its marginal cost. Therefore, it's going to choose a profit maximizing quantity of 50 and a profit maximizing price of $4, let's say. This gives us the retailer profit. Notice that the retailer profit is much lower than it was before. Some of that profit has been gobbled up by the wholesaler. However, the total amount of profit is now less than when the uh, retailer was buying from a competitive industry. How do we know that? Well, we know that because the retailer could have set a price of $4 before, but it chose not to. Its profit maximizing price was lower. It was $3. So the total amount of profits has actually fallen. The retailer profit plus the wholesaler profit is lower than when the monopolist was buying from a competitive industry. Another way of putting that is if these two monopolies, the retailer and the wholesaler, could combine, they would choose to set a lower price. But they don't. They don't unless they can make some bargain, and that may be hard because of transactions costs, especially if we have multiple uh, wholesalers. Finally, notice that the deadweight loss has increased dramatically. So the double monopoly problem makes everyone worse off. It makes the monopolists worse off than if they were to combine into a single monopoly, and it makes consumers worse off. And quantity, quantity falls by a lot. Quantity with the two monopolies has fallen in half where it was when if there was just one monopoly. So the double monopoly markup problem is really serious. It reduces the size of the economy dramatically, and it does so in a way which makes everybody worse off. Let's look at some applications. Here's some applications of this model. As I've already mentioned, it means that vertical integration of two monopolies can improve social welfare. Monopolies overall aren't great, but if you're going to have a monopoly, it's better to have one vertically integrated monopoly than two vertical monopolies. Classic example of this is Microsoft. Microsoft was accused of sort of leveraging its monopoly in operating systems in order to get a monopoly in browsers. But consider, would you rather have Microsoft with a monopoly in operating systems and let's say Netscape with a monopoly in browsers or Microsoft with monopoly in both. 
Well, it's better for consumers, for Microsoft to have a monopoly in both because you will get lower prices, you will get increased output, and from Microsoft's point of view, Microsoft will actually have higher profits as well. So in this case, it's better to have one big monopoly, vertically integrated monopoly, than two vertical monopolies. Patents and cumulative innovation is another application. So patents create a monopoly. That's fine if we're talking about a monopoly on a consumer item, a consumer good like a chair or something like that. That monopoly may be necessary in order to generate the research and development needed to produce this new product. Things get tricky, however, when the monopolists are selling to other producers. When you have monopolies which build upon monopolies. When, you, when one product requires many different monopolized uh, inputs. In that case, then the total production may be lower when you have each one of these monopolists trying to grab up a larger share of the pie, the actual pie may get smaller. Finally, and most importantly for our point of view, is the application to development. And the idea here is that monopolies or inefficiencies in intermediate goods could really shrink the economy. So for example, if we have uh, intermediate good of electricity, it's really bad to have a monopoly in electricity production because that is going to make every other uh, sector of the economy which uses electricity also worse off. Um, it's same thing with inefficiencies. If you have an inefficient financial sector, and the financial sector is an input into many other goods, then that's really going to shrink the economy. So anytime you have goods, intermediate goods, that is goods which are used to produce other goods, or services which are used to produce other services, it's especially important to have competitive markets in those intermediate goods. Bad to have monopolies in consumer goods, but it's much worse to have monopolies in intermediate goods because those inefficiencies and those monopolies are then expanded throughout the economy. Further reading on this, there's a very nice piece by Stephen Landsberg and Slate on the Microsoft operating system browser uh, dilemma. That's called monopoly shopping. You can look at my book, Tabarox, uh, Launching the Innovation Renaissance, for more on patents. And there's several good pieces on uh, intermediate goods and monopoly uh, in the case of development. One is by Charles Jones, Intermediate Goods and Weak Links in the Theory of Economic Development. And the other is by Parenti and Prescott, Monopoly Rights, a Barrier to Riches. There's an article of that name. There's also a book by Parenti and Prescott, which makes the same point. Thanks.